before they had a union? That's before they had a union. Well, even for some time after we had a union, then we got things ironed out where we could, uh, uh, we had much better working conditions. Uh, the working conditions were very poor uh, before the union. Well, what do you do uh, now at the shop, Kenny? Uh, now I'm considered a tool inspector. I inspect perishable tools, all the new tools that come into the shop. And uh, you also have uh, a little business on the side. You have an ice cream uh, company or a retail center or something? Yeah, I have a little place down on South Madison. We manufacture ice cream and sell sandwiches and soft drinks. Is it a drive-in? It's a little drive-in. Uh, uh, Ken, uh, I can't help but uh, remember when uh, I was a boy growing up in this town, uh, the people who worked in the factories by and large uh, lived in uh, the downtown area or uh, in the adjacent area, uh, and uh, houses that were characteristically working class that you could recognize as such. And uh, when I come out and talk with you and uh, other fellows who have been uh, working at Warner here for uh, 30, 35 years, uh, I find that uh, you live in the suburbs, and uh, you are an example here of a gentleman who has a half-acre estate and a, a beautiful home that was certainly passed for middle class in any American town. Uh, you have two cars, uh, and uh, you have a piano in the living room, a color television, uh, 300 books, uh, some uh, classics that I noticed a while ago on the bookshelf. And uh, now, is this, is this characteristic of the kind of progress that's been made by the people who work in the shop for the last 30, 35 years? I believe it is uh, with many of them. Of course, there's still fellows in the shop, I suppose, that are uh, have trouble getting ahead in the world and are uh, constantly uh, uh, beridden, I might say, with uh, a lot of finance and uh, interest rates that uh, large families, they probably have an awful time getting ahead. Harder now, probably, than it was previously. Oh, you had two uh, children? I have two children, boy and a girl. And they both went through college? Both went through college. Uh -huh. And, uh, and uh, they, uh, one of them is a teacher, and the other is working on a master's degree now. Right. Uh -huh. uh, now, would this have happened uh, a generation ago, a man working in a factory, would he expect to send his uh, sons and daughters uh, through college? No, I think that was a thing that wasn't even hardly considered at that time. I don't think there's many factory people sent their children to college back when I was young. Man. They hoped they could get them through high school, maybe. I think most of them hoped that, but I don't think there was too much uh, opposition to boy going out and working when he left. 13 or 16? Yeah. Yeah, to get a job. I started, I worked in the shop actually when I was 15. I had a little trouble getting a working permit. Mm -hmm. uh, worked on a shipping gang at uh, Baldwin. Mm -hmm. uh, have you been working since you were 15? Yes, but, well, about 15 and a half, I suppose. I, they let me to school fine for 16. I went through the eighth grade and uh, the front officer asked me a little bit, but they finally decided if I got a working permit to let me go. Mm -hmm. uh, what uh, what were your uh, objectives? What did you look forward to doing when you were a boy, 16 years old? Well, I don't suppose I had too much interest in politics or church or anything else like that, really. I don't really know how to answer that. I, I reckon I was an average boy. I like to go around a little dating and like to have a little spending money, and uh, usually I went out and worked for it. And, uh, I made my spending money. Uh, when I was a young boy, of the Depression, and uh, several of us took a couple of little bumming hikes, which uh, the average kid don't do anymore, don't think. Uh, one pair of us hitchhiked up east one time on a, about a week and a half trip, and then another time, another friend of mine decided I uh, decided that we would hitchhike to California. And uh, uh, I don't remember what year that was now, but I think I was uh, maybe about 17 then. And we started hitchhiking. We got uh, out to the state of Colorado, and it was impossible to catch another ride. So we sent our baggage and what trunk, uh, what uh, we had a little suitcase with us, sent it back home, and started catching the freight train. And we moved to California and back, and it was a rough trip, about 10 weeks of it, and we had $8, and we left Muncie. And I never appreciated Indiana any more in my life, I don't think, than when I saw Indiana on that train coming back home. Mm -hmm. And you uh, went to work at Warner Gear then, uh, in the mid-30s, before, uh, really uh, during the Depression, before the Union was organized. Uh, did you, as uh, a worker at Warner Gear, uh, look forward to having uh, a labor organization come into the shop? Well, I was I was an instrumental in getting the organization. Well, you were really quite young at that time. Yeah, but uh, I was one. I joined further. I think I was about 
I forget what my number was then. It seems like it was 700, but I was in with, with them when they raised their badges. You know, they had a badge raising day. No, I didn't know that. When was that? Well, I couldn't tell you what year that was, but uh, one day everybody raised their badges, put them on. Up until that time, it's free, you know. But uh, this one day, everybody raised their badges and says, we're union. And uh, it was organized right then, I think. I was uh, probably 37. Yeah, it was in 37, but I couldn't remember the date. Uh -huh. It was in the summertime. Uh -huh. uh, did you vote for the union? When oh, yeah. Did your election? Mm -hmm. uh, what were some of the uh, gains that you think uh, were made by Local 287 uh, during the 1930s, the early uh, years of organization? Well, of course, uh, seniority was a wonderful gain. Uh, it was, it was a... It just simply meant that uh, you had a job as long as you had seniority. You couldn't be relieved for some farmer's uh, friend or relative or something like that. Uh, I, I couldn't tell you how fast we gained uh, better wages, but we started out gaining wages right now. And uh, we started out getting better working conditions, but they improved much, much more all through the years. Mm -hmm. uh when did you, uh, you became a, a member of the organization then, about the time that uh, the union gained recognition by the company. Now, what uh, offices have you held in the local union? Well, I haven't held too many offices, really. I never was on the committee. I've been an owner committeeman, and I've been an owner and steward, but it seems like it's, uh, I've been on the executive board quite a bit. I never was envious of the committeeman's job, but I think you've got a tough job if they want to do it right. I never was envious of the president's job because he's got a tremendous job if he does it right. He's bothered to, to no end at home and at work. So uh, I've always been on the board quite a bit. But so what are some of the jobs you've had on the board? Well, actually, I've always run for trustee. How right. many times have you had a trustee's job? I think three times. Do they have three trustees? Three trustees. And you've had that job uh, three different times. Mm -hmm. Do you have an office now in the union? Nothing uh, elective. Well, I'm uh, disappointed, and I'd like to make a correction here. He said something about president of the park board. I'm considered chairman of the park board. Oh, chairman of the park uh -huh. board. Mm -hmm. And there are how many members of the park board? Uh, we've had a, a big and small park board. We welcome anybody that wants to be on it because there's so many committees and so many things to look at that uh, actually actively, I'd have to count them, but I'd say we've got about uh, 20 members on there, but we've only got a about uh, half of them are active. I see. Now, Kenny, you've been uh, very generous with your time, and you've taken me out to the uh, park and uh, shown me around, and uh, I'm quite favorably impressed, most people would be, I think, to see uh, a group of uh, factory workers uh, through their uh, union purchase this kind of facility and develop it almost like a private country club estate, as well, it amounts to a country club mm -hmm. uh, for the members of the organization. Uh, for example, let's uh, recap, if we can, a little bit of some of the things that you're developing uh, on the ground. Now you have what? You have uh, uh, you have a lake? We have a real nice lake. It was originally a gravel pit. and uh, That's used for what? For swimming and fishing? Swimming and fishing. And you're uh, building a basketball court? We're building a basketball court. We've got real nice, uh, real nice uh, regulation horseshoe court. We built a new uh, bathhouse with uh, much more adequate restroom facilities and uh, dressing booths than we had in connection with a uh, concession stand that will give us good fresh food where previously we had uh, food from a uh, spinning machine. Now we'll have good food, drinks, fresh popcorn, we've got our popcorn popper, and a nice little place for the kids to dance. We've uh, developed our beach much prettier than it was, and we'll have a nice uh, grassy lounging area for the swimmers if they want it, or they can be in the sand. Yeah, picnic area. We've got a really nice picnic area with uh, charcoal pots and a nice well out there in the picnic area. We've got a little playground area. We've got an ideal situation for for family diversion. A uh, mother can, or the children and the dad can all swim, or any of them can fish. The little kids have got playgrounds. They can eat. They can get uh, good refreshment. Uh, we don't allow any alcoholic beverages on the property. Uh, we haven't had much trouble with it. What little we have, we've got rid of it without any trouble. And it's just a nice environment for the whole family. And uh, What's the park called? Springwater Park. Springwater Park. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, when did you buy the grounds? I bought the grounds. Uh, I'm no good on remembering dates, and I've had so many figures in my mind, but this is the third summer we've been out there. Uh, and, what, uh, what's your attendance like now on a typical uh, weekend, uh, let's say last summer? Well, last summer I think we had some weekends at 700. That's, uh, Saturday and Sunday is always a big day on swimming, of course. Just under normal conditions, there's yeah. no special track. No special track. Mm -hmm. uh, now, you also have a nice woodland area in back of your lake. We've got a nice woods, and I'm not sure of the dimensions of it, but I think it's roughly eight acres. And it will be developed later on into a, a nice deal, another picnic area with a lot of shade. One thing we're a little short of on our picnic ground now is shade. And it'll be a nice spot for camping, a nice spot for uh, any extracurricular activity that uh, some group in our union might want to throw a dance or anything back there. They want a little privacy. Uh huh. And you're going to build a building in that? Well, we're, we're just thinking it's in the dreaming stage now. We're thinking about, uh, of course, uh, restroom facilities and a nice big. Uh, uh, I can't think what I want to say. What do you have in the parks? Uh, shelter house. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. Shelter house. Not really a building, probably. Uh-huh. But we've also got, already had some of these iron pots, but we'll have them back here for charcoal. Yes. Now, you've got uh, a fence around most of the ground, too. We've got a fence around about all the grounds from the outside and a complete encirclement of the water for our own protection against little tots getting in there without the folks and stuff like that. I see. Uh, do you remember how much you paid for it to begin with? Uh, I don't remember the exact figure, but I think it was around 32000 uh -huh. uh, At this time, I understand we have about 88000 in the park of the Anderson figures. And that includes uh, the uh, development? It includes the development. We have a very expensive fence. We put up a lot of chain link fence six foot high and that ran into money. We, We've developed the park for the future. We figure that the park's going to belong to the local for years to come. And everything's been built or changed. It's been made of masonry or aluminum. We've uh, run the uh, electric conduit, underground third length park, number six wire, which can uh, always be spread from that to any size of wire you want. We think six will take care of anything anybody can ever possibly want. Mm -hmm. And uh, this uh, park now is about how far uh, from your labor center? Well, I guess about uh, four miles. Uh -huh. uh, about how much is the labor center worth, do you think? Gee, I don't know, know what, the what, what the value of the place would be today, but I, I would guess that the market value of the day would probably be almost twice as much as it was when it was built, but I really wouldn't know what it would be today. Mm -hmm. Uh, but the value of, uh, what, what's the value of your park? About uh, 88000 you say, no? Well, we'd have to value that now because we've got that in it. Mm -hmm. And, of course, a lot of 88000 is labor. It, it takes an awful lot of labor out there. We do a lot of bulldozing, a lot of carpenter work all the time. And uh, a lot of people not, might not be able to see it unless they saw the place originally, see. But uh, we have to almost call it 88000 asset because that's what we put in it out of another fund. You told me also uh, uh, that uh, now you've been a member of the trust. You've been a trustee for a long time, different times. And you told me that uh, you have around three hundred thousand dollars in assets now. Is this, is this a, a savings? Is this money you really have in addition to your real estate? That's right. The local. I'd say we had a little over three hundred thousand now at the last count, and uh, well, that's in your welfare fund and your general fund, and in uh, savings accounts we have around different banks. Well, where does this money come from? Well, it all comes from union dues. It comes from the individual members. Do you make any money uh, down at the labor center, for example, out of your restaurant? There's very little money made, I think, in the restaurant. Try to break even. I doubt whether they quite break even. I so, uh, We rent fairly reasonable to other locals' office rooms. Mm -hmm. And uh, I really don't know. Uh, the building down there is, uh, is in another uh, establishment. It's called Eastern Indiana. Uh, I think it's called Eastern Indiana Housing Association. And, uh, but this is controlled by Local 287. That's right. It's controlled by Local 287 members. They have their own election, their own board, and they look after the property. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, will the park board uh, be controlled by... Uh, will the park be controlled by a park board? Or will it be governed directly by uh, the executive board of, of the local? It's governed directly by the executive board. The park board, any time that they have uh, anything they want to do, they do it in the form of recommendation to the executive board. The executive board either okays it or rejects it. Mm -hmm. 
All right, who owns the Labor Center, Local 287 or the International Union? Local 287 owns it indirectly through the Eastern Indiana Labor Center. All right, how about the parks? Well, this need to be eventually put into some sort of an indirect uh, corporation? Well, I don't know. Uh, I doubt it. There probably people think it should be. Uh, there's always been people in our local union that thought someday the International, for some reason, uh, they might take us over and then they'd have all of our valuable assets. But I doubt whether that ever happened. I really don't know. How many uh, dues-paying members do you have now, do you know? In the union? I couldn't tell you that. I'd have to come out of the financial secretary's office. Uh -huh. Something over 3,000. I don't know what it is. How about retirees? You know how many you have? The last count I had was 300 and so. Uh huh. Right. Now, uh, can the retirees use the park as well as uh, the active members? Oh, yes. Uh, actually, all of our members can even bring guests. Hmm. And uh, but we do insist on uh, a person entering the park now uh, having a a card to show so we know that a member is coming in. As a matter of fact, I think we ought to have some programs made up for uh, the retirees and any auxiliary or any other unit of our local union uh, just to get them out and get them playing this park because I think a lot of people don't realize how nice it is and how nice it could be for them. I think that's probably so. And this is also true of the Labor Center. I think you have a beautiful facility there. You have a nice lounge area and you have a nice meeting room. Uh, a spacious office, and I, I think that you really have a fine facility and a committee room, which uh, I've used to take some interviews with. Uh, I'd so like to say something. Ahead. Well, I think we've got a pretty nice building, and the thing, the reason I kind of like it now, there has been talk about it being built out towards the plants and stuff like that, but it is in the center of town. It's a lot easier for people to get to that maybe doesn't have a car, you know. Right. And I just think we're pretty lucky because... Uh, no matter how much politics enters into this argument, this part of the union, uh, we've been lucky on having guys that's looked after the property. The property's in good shape and been well taken care of. When the chips are down, uh, is it true that the factions within the, the labor union, you have, you know as well as I do, you have political infighting going on there, just the way you do in the uh, outside community. Yeah. Uh, but when the chips are down, uh, regardless of who wins in office, do you really have a continued progressive development uh, uh, of the union affairs, and do you continue to uh, try to provide the same services or even better services than you did before, and this sort of thing? I'd say we've been pretty fortunate on that. I think I think we have uh, grown any way you want to figure, monetarily or any way. Uh, there's some hard losers sometimes, and they're probably a little adverse to participating or doing what they should do, but I'd say we've been lucky on everything growing up. Uh, Kenny, you have had, I think, many appointed jobs. You've always served in, uh, on various committees and had various uh, responsibilities with the union, uh, and uh, you've kept a uh, pretty uh, close tab on what's going on. So thinking back over the, uh, what amounts to about 35 years now, that you've been there, uh, what stands out in your mind as some of the major achievements that you have seen, some of the major accomplishments uh, of the Union, major advancements, uh, uh, landmarks of progress, or whatever we might want to call it? Well, of course, seniority and fairness is probably one of the finest things any working man can achieve mm -hmm. from his employer. We've all been living, I'm sure of that. Uh, maybe I've been a little more fortunate some and something more <clears throat> fortunate than I have. Uh, but uh, I really always had something a little bit going for me on the side. It seems like uh, when you're sending your kids to college or building a new home or something like that, uh, it takes a little bit extra. Now, is this typical? Uh, do many of the fellows who work on the machines and the factory uh, have something going outside? I'd, I'd say. <laughs> I'd say a, a lot of them have. I wouldn't know what percentage it'd be, but I'd say a lot of them do that. Uh, I know Don Null, for example, he used to work in the shop, and uh, now he has uh, the Rambler Agency. Rambler Agency. Yeah. And we just stopped to see Jim Wilson. Uh, Jim's grandfather was the first Secretary of Labor, and this was quite yeah. an interesting talk we had. Jim now has uh, almost a $200,000 business yeah, it looks out, like it. out there in the trailer industry, and he also, of course, still works in the shop. He was active in uh, union politics. Yeah, uh, he was a good union man, I thought. Yes. Well, now, what uh, What else? Uh, you had, uh, first of all, your seniority, 
And uh, since that time, you've had consistent increases in pay. Uh, almost every contract you negotiated, you had uh, improvements in pay. Uh, you gained your uh, working conditions is a, a big thing we've got. We work on that all the time. That better's every year. So for example, what kind of working conditions do you have better? Uh, I was thinking more of the line of tangible things such as pensions and well, uh, insurance, but let's stick with working conditions for a while. Well, working conditions, for instance, uh, uh, now we can negotiate for dirty air removal and stuff like that, or used to be a man that sat in there and maybe breathed emery dust or something like that, and nobody uh, even thought they could get in and done about it. That, that stuff is, uh, uh, the shop's cleaner used to be, uh, if we have more, uh, way much more air circulation in the plant than we used to have. Of course, it can still be better a lot, but the uh, place is kept cleaner and, uh, uh, the company uh, receptive to suggestions that union members make or the uh, uh, the union officers make when they go in and ask uh, for uh, better working conditions or uh, for uh, clean housekeeping and this sort of thing. Uh, does the company listen when you go in and, and ask for uh, changes in uh, the working conditions of the employees? Well, of course, like I said, I've never been on a negotiating committee, but I'd say, in, uh, in my experience, that the first thing the company says when you go in ask for something is uh, no. And usually that's, uh, even though they uh, would agree to it, they're probably using it for uh, something to negotiate with. Mm -hmm. In other words, they want something back for. And, uh, but, uh, it's according to who you're dealing with in the company. Some guys might think this is a good idea, and another guy might think it wouldn't be. I just feel like you and I. Too. Mm -hmm. Normally, they're adverse uh, to our proposals on anything because they, uh, well, I reckon just they want something to negotiate with, so that's what they use. Kenny, do you think then that, uh, that these better working conditions uh, are really a result of union activity? That if the union had not been organized and had not continued to press for these, uh, reforms around uh, the conditions of the shop. These reforms would not have taken place and improvements would not have taken place without uh, pressure from the union? It might have taken place in some plans, but I'd say in most plans, and probably in ours, you never know now, but I'd mm -hmm. say in most plans, it would never take taken place without pressure from the union. Mm -hmm. Do you uh, feel that uh, the company accepts the union as the collective bargaining agent for the employees now or uh, you get the impression that uh, the company would probably be happier if there wasn't a union. I kind of get the impression now that they accept it, and it's a, it's a thing that works now. I think they were scared to death of it at first, but I think they accept it now, and in many cases, the uh, union helps the company. Indirectly, my thought is that the union has helped everybody in this country because it stopped. It not only stopped, the poverty, but it's created uh, favorable conditions for the average man to live in a middle class home like I am. Well, let's talk about that a little bit more now. Now, you've made a statement here, which uh, uh, I'm sure you believe profoundly, and I suspect it uh, represents the thinking of uh, many of the union members uh, who have uh, made tremendous gains the past uh, generation or so. Uh, you made the statement that uh, Organized labor had really advanced the standard of living for many Americans outside the labor movement in general. Uh, is this so? For the community in general? Yes. I think it has. Uh, the fact that I think it's a great deterrent to communism. Whenever we fight poverty, I think we're fighting communism. That's helped everybody. Well, now, how does the labor union uh, fight poverty? Oh, it's, it's raised their standard. Just what I've got here in my home and everything, it's raised their standard of living to such an extent. The only thing that worries me is that people that are not, that are not organized, people that um, are on fixed income, they're probably being hurt a little bit now because the union has created higher wages, which is, I suppose, caused a certain amount of this inflation spiral. But I think that most industry has taken advantage of the situation and created a lot more of the inflation spiral than we have. Raise prices uh, far beyond what the every cost year, of labor would every be. Every year they gain on it, I think. Mm -hmm. Now then, the poor people that's on the fixed income, well, they're hurting a little bit there, and uh, I feel sorry for them. Maybe something will come around to help them. Maybe we'll get more liberal government or something that will help them out.
We're getting it all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, do you, uh, this, is, this is a value adjustment question, I suppose, but uh, do you uh, really uh, think that if Local 287 UOW had not come in, you want to stop here and answer the telephone? Let me check. Right. All right, we'll interrupt. I don't think we'll boys. The uh, question I was getting ready to uh, pose just before your telephone rang, uh, Kenny, was uh, do you believe that um, you could not have afforded this type home, you would not have made the kind of economic advancement that you obviously have made during the past 30, 35 years uh, without Local 287? Well, I don't believe it could. I, I think you have to fight for everything, and I think this is one of our causes, and we fought for it, and I just can't imagine uh, us getting it without it. I think uh, Local 287 labor movement has definitely helped me. All right. Uh, now, has there been more improvement made during the past, do you think, during the past uh, generation among the working class than there had been during the previous generation among the working class? Oh, I definitely think that. Uh, my land's... Uh, if it wasn't for labor, I don't think probably uh, you wouldn't even have uh, Social Security, maybe. And of course, with Medicare coming on, and now in the uh, labor movement itself or pension plans, uh, my dad in law, uh, of course, he's dead now, but when he retired, uh, his Social Security was not hardly enough for him to exist on, and he didn't get a cent from the shop. Now, men put their life in the shop all their life, and we've proven now that arrangements can be made. For them to have a little benefit from all their earnings all those years to retire on, see. We never had that before. And now we've got a good insurance program where it used to be you go out and maybe a guy had a tough road to hoe, maybe something hit him bad and it cost him five, ten thousand mm dollars. -hmm. We haven't got anything to worry about on that anymore. All we, right, go ahead. We just do that collectively now through the insurance program, which we get through our union. All right. In spite of the fact now that you've had to fight, as you say, to uh, make the gains that you have made and uh, your wages and working conditions, uh, how do you feel about uh, the company, about Warner Gear? Do you uh, feel that, that they have been grossly unfair to you and uh, that uh, uh, do you feel any sense of, of loyalty to them? Do you feel that they're an integral part of the community and that Warner Gear has really made a contribution to the community as you feel about your labor union? I certainly do. I, uh, I, uh very appreciative of the fact that Warner Gears in Muncie and that I'm uh, working there. Uh, some of the individuals that uh, operate the company I think are very unfair. I've had some personal instances of that myself where I thought that uh, some members of management, some members of management mm -hmm. just turned you down flat on uh, on ideas that you thought would be good for everybody and wouldn't even cost any money. They turned you down flat. For some reason, whether he just thought he was foolish, or he didn't want to mess with you, or he didn't want to take it to his superior, one or the other. And one of them was on blood bank. I had a personal understanding myself. I was trying to make it a community bank, so that we'd always have plenty of blood at any time, and they just turned down flat. Uh, but in spite of that, uh, you feel that you would prefer to work at Warner Gear to Chevrolet or Delco, Battery or. Uh, Agnelli or one of the other auto plants in the, in the town? Well, uh, of course, I'm first there. Forced is there, too. I'm, uh, I've been there a long time, and I was watching my chance, and I got a good fan, probably good a job as Ridden Water Gear. <laughs> but uh, I don't know. I suppose all in all, Warner Gear pays a little bit better than these other plants, but I suppose if I started in the other plant, I'd rather be there, I suppose. Uh, you, you would have developed more if you in whatever plant you worked at. Uh, what uh, approximately... Do you suppose uh, the average uh, machine operator at Warner Gear makes on a yearly basis today? Does he make 8000 10000 12000 6000 or what? The average? Uh -huh. Well, there's figures on that, and I don't know what the average is, but I guess it's around uh, 85 to 90. I'd say 85, good 85, yeah. Mm -hmm. And do you have any idea what it was uh, when you went to work at Warner Gear? When I went to work at Warner Gear, I reckon a man is lucky then if he made... Uh, I suppose twenty dollars a week is pretty top budget. And now they make a hundred and fifty or sixty a week. Oh yeah, or two hundred. Up to two hundred a week. Mm -hmm. About eight times then. Well, we we mentioned averages before, but I'd say there's some guys making two hundred a week. I think my pay runs around a hundred and seventy or something. I forget what so it is. the average person now working at Warner Gear is probably making uh, 
six, seven, or eight times as much as he was making 35 years ago. Right. Now, the cost of living has gone up, but it hasn't gone up that much. That's right. So you have made some tangible, concrete gains uh, in your standard of living based on your purchasing power of what you earn, what you bring home. That's correct. Uh, now, in addition to this, you also have uh, an employment compensation. Right. You have your supplemental unemployment uh, benefits program. Right. You have your uh, retirement plan. Right. You have paid insurance. Right. You have seniority rights. Right. Uh, you have a um, few free holidays. How many? Few. We've got eight now a year. Free eight holidays. holidays. Paid vacations. Did we mention that? We've got paid vacations according to your time work. Uh, how much uh, paid vacation are you entitled to uh, in 1969? In 1969, well, it's, that's based on percentage. In my case, I get 6.5% of my straight hour earnings. For the whole year? Yeah. And then we got a little uh, Christmas vacation bonus now. It's 2% too, uh, for Christmas. We got one little thing that uh, might be interesting on this tape that come up. A lot of guys think it's foolish, but uh, we're allowed to pay now for jury duty. And my idea of jury duty in this country has probably been one of the unfairest things on earth on this account. A lot of people can't afford to be on jury duty. Uh -huh. And then there's loafers around the courthouse that can well afford to be on jury duty, and they'll make a trial or a jury panel session last as long as they can to get all they can get out of it. And a working man will make it as short as he can to get back to work, see? And to me, this is kind of important because now a man leaving the shop going on jury duty, he's got his income. We've got that in our agreement now. And I think it could be very instrumental in having fair trials. Very instrumental. Well, Ken, now you've mentioned a lot of things here uh, during the course of our discussion that the workers at Warning Gary have gained uh, after organizing Local 287. And you indicate, and I think quite correctly, that... Uh, uh, this represents a tremendous achievement over what the gains would have been uh, without the union or what they had been during the previous uh, generation without a union. Now, my question to you is, uh, what is there left to gain? Have you uh, made all the achievements and all of the gains uh, that the union was organized to achieve? And uh, what's the use to have a union now? Well, we're going to hold what we got. And we can still improve our living standards too. Things as we was talking about just a second ago. This park is a wonderful thing that we're gaining today. All right. So we've got a welfare program that's a wonderful thing. Any man in our union that's uh, in distress can figure out help from our financial officer up there. And uh, we've got a nice fund in that department. Any man that has a burnout automatically gets a piece of money if he has a fire burnout. Any man that. Now you had one, didn't you? I had one. It's not a big thing, but if you have two rooms or more destroyed, at my time it's $100. You just give it a hundred bucks. Well, it don't sound like much, but right now you got a fire and we're sitting out in the front yard the next morning looking at our house, see. Ain't got nothing. Well, I didn't really need that hundred bucks, but it was so nice to have that hundred bucks stuck in your pocket. For what? Going to the motel or getting your dinner or whatever. You might be short of change. So anyhow, we got that now. If a man's off work four weeks now, now some of these figures might be a little wrong, but when he comes back to work, naturally he's going to work a week before he gets a check. So we give that man fifty bucks. Now, this welfare program right now, if he's off four weeks, plus $5 for each child he's got. And just things like this, that we're making things better for ourselves through our dues. And, uh, of course, we have the concessions in the, in the shop, and that's all good to our welfare fund, which amounts to a pretty good piece of money. Uh, we mentioned before about all this is done with dues, but uh, the vending machines in the shop, as long as you think we get the benefits from that. That completely goes to welfare, and welfare is a wonderful thing because uh, a lot of people get short, and we uh, help a lot of people with uh, utilities. A lot of young guys are like that, too. More young guys than old guys, probably because they just haven't got no state established yet, and they're usually in debt when they're out of work. They're down right now, I think. So if a guy gets down sick, he can count on utility bills being paid. Of course, the welfare committee will check him out. He can count on uh, food. He can count on medicine or anything like that. We've got a good, big fund for that. Well, that's quite interesting. Now, the company doesn't contribute to your welfare fund at all. Not a dime. This is your own program. Now, to uh, uh, the SUB program, the Supplemental Unemployment Benefit. Uh, this, as I understand it, uh, each employee contributes a nickel an hour to that program. Do you know about that? 
indirectly the company it's in lieu of wages the company. No. so really it's uh, it's in lieu of your wages so it's uh, the work really money it in, yeah. and instead of it coming to you as it would have done the company keeps it in a fund in a fund mm -hmm. and uh, where does it go to the state or does the company just keep it for you the company keeps it in a bank that she calls it in trust and draws it in who gets the interest well, it stays in the fund oh i see it i understand it does i think it does yeah it accumulates i see now, who administers this fund? Does the union have anything to do with that, or does the company uh, administer the fund? The company administers it, and the company administers the insurance also, but uh, the union has a, a couple members that sits in with two members from the company on the committee to thrash out their problems. On the insurance and also on the SUV? SUV? Mm -hmm. I see. Uh, and uh, are the records open to you, the union members? Well, I hope so. I don't know. I've never seen them done. I know the insurance record was. I was on the insurance committee one time when this insurance was bought. I happened to be on the insurance committee at that time. How about the retirement plan? Do you have representation on that committee? That we, administers the retirement plan? We've got a retirement plan, but honestly, I couldn't tell you, Dan, whether uh, they set in on meetings or not. But uh, I suppose so. But about everybody knows their retirement now. I think about all the committee does. Now, we have a retirement committee also. And... Uh, I don't know whether they have meetings with the company or not, mm -hmm. but uh, our whole union, our organization knows enough about the retirement that if things wasn't uh, up to par, why well, there'd be something done about it. Now, you mentioned earlier, Ken, that you thought uh, Local 287 uh, had not only been uh, a boon or an advantage to the members of Local 287, but it also had uh, helped the community, either directly or indirectly. You think the uh, community uh, feels this way, Ken? No, I don't think so. I think the average person that's not closely related to the union thinks that we're a bunch of uh, lions or something like that. As a matter of fact, I remember one time when I was on the board of ministry here in town, come to our local union, asking for a little help. He had a project here in town, and uh, we helped him. We usually always helped everybody come. We give them a little bit of something at least. We put out quite a bit of money in the community like that every year. But when this man left, when this minister left, he just made the remark, he says, uh, and he thanked us, and uh, he wasn't being uh, mischievous. Or he might have been a little mischievous because he said, uh, well, I didn't know what I was getting into a den of lions or what I was getting into, but I sure want to thank you guys. We won him over completely. He, he actually thought he was getting into a bunch of rough guys, I suppose. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. And... Uh, We've got some rough guys. We've got we've got a lot of radicals in our union. We've got a lot of conservatives. I don't know how to balance out, but I, like I said to you before, when I was talking, I think it takes both of them to come to a happy mean. I just hope that the conservatives don't win completely, and I'll for the radicals do. And uh, uh, are the, in, in general, would you think the leadership of Local 287 and the UAW uh, represent? Uh, Good, conscientious, patriotic Americans who are trying to build a better world. Definitely. I wish more people would realize that. They're just an average. I mean, if they live next door to you and you didn't know that they belong to Local 287, you wouldn't hold that against them. But if you know it, they have a tendency to hold it against this thing. On account of they think about the strikes, I suppose, and so forth like that. And uh, they think how fruitless the strikes are. Well, some of them are fruitless, but they're not intended to be when we go on them. Are intended to make gains. And as far as Local 287 is concerned, uh, we've made great gains. Well, very fine. Well, do you think the uh, younger members of uh, Local 287, the fellows who have come in, let's say, in the 1960s, uh, have the same attitude toward the union that you have and the fellows who uh, worked there during the 1930s and 40s? Uh, or do you think that they uh, have sort of a Lastly, fair, passive attitude toward the union, and sort of take it for granted, and aren't even sure that they have benefited from it. Well, I'm afraid that most of them take it for granted, just like your child or my child would. That didn't come up through hard depression years. We come up through hard years in the labor movement where we didn't have no strike benefits. People got beat up. Some of them got beat up terrible, but even police. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think the average young guy takes it in stride and doesn't realize what. Uh, what a battle it was in the beginning. But we do have a lot of young guys also get active. I got fellow young fellows on my uh, park board that's real active and uh, 
Yeah. I met a uh, fellow named Jim Tharp a while ago. Right. He looks he's like he's them. maybe in his late 20s. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He's one of them. They appreciate it, some of them, but I think the average young guy, just like I said, our children don't realize how tough it could be, see. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, you mentioned a while ago that you have radicals and conservatives in your labor movement, but you also hope that uh, you think you need them, and you think that each of them can make a contribution, but you hope that neither uh, extreme element ever gains control. Why? Well, because I think that uh, if you want to alter radical, uh, you'd probably uh, ruin your or what little bit of uh, good opinion we do have in the community, of course. If you want to alter conservative, you'd probably lose your your whole uh, structure because uh, they'd just give in. I think it'd be passive to the company. That's what I consider conservative in the in the labor movement. See, so uh, wants to go back to laissez-faire and, yeah. and uh, let the company uh, run the show and decide how many hours you should work and uh, what your wages should be. And right. you know. So I think the two fighting each other, and then we come up with our boards and our committees and. Uh, I think they balance out each other, and they always have balanced out each other pretty well. Mm-hmm. Uh, when did you build uh, the Labor Center? Do you remember that? What year? I couldn't tell you. I'm it was in the early 50s, wasn't it? Yeah. I'm often mm-hmm. poor on remembering dates. Like I was in college at the time. I, I, I remember it. Well, I can look that up, any of them. Uh, did you have anything to do with that? Were you on the, uh, do you remember whether you were on uh, the building committee or uh, a trustee at the time? I didn't have anything to do in that, and I don't remember why. Uh, I know there was quite a, uh, a racket about it. There was a lot of for and against it. There was a lot of for and against keeping it in the local union and putting it in this housing association. And But it's uh, worked out all right, I think. And, uh, but I, I had nothing in there, no. Mm-hmm. Well, can you think of anything else uh, that you would like to uh, contribute to uh, the discussion that we haven't covered during the uh, 45 minutes or so we've been talking here? Well, I can't say much else except when the union, I know when the union started, the finance secretary, uh, his office was his pocket. And that was Ralph Fisher. That's right. And uh, I think Ralph was strictly honest. I think every dime come to us is long to us. And then we got enough money ahead to rent us a hall. When the, when the union was young, we also had the welfare back then, but everybody, I can remember when money would be laying up around that desk and file that has changed, you know, out of the vending machine. And fellas brought it from their homes and everything like that, and it was just a lousy way to run a business. I'd just like to say that since then, now about everything, almost everything except petty cash is done by check and vouchers. It's signed and countersigned with the president and the treasurer. I think it'd be awful hard for anybody to steal any money out of our local union anymore. It's possible that some of it could be misused or wasted. But we've got a good sound business now. It's just so much sounder than it was originally, but we just had a grill then, so. And, uh, I think everything's strictly on the up and up, and uh, I'm real interested in it. I believe it. Well, now, you have, have how much longer to work before you retire? Well, I'm 55 and a half. I've got enough points that I could have retired at 55. And the only thing you gain by retiring at 55 instead of 60 is 60 if you're in the high bracket of wages, which I think I'm in. I can retire $400 a month until I go on Social Security. The only thing you gain, or you don't gain nothing, the only thing you get by retiring at 55 is five years or more out of the shop. They just cut the 400 and a half and go to two. You don't lose nothing or you don't gain nothing. You just cut out your wages and get the same amount of money and twice as much time. And uh, I'll probably stay in there when I'm 60. I'm sure I'll get out when I'm 60. Uh, but uh, that's probably about another four and a half years from me. Well, now what are you going to do so far as the union is concerned during that four and a half years? Are you going to continue active in uh, Local 287? Well, I'm running for office right now. What are you running for now? I'm running for, for treasurer. Mm-hmm. Uh, there might be a little greedy aspect to it. I suppose all of us have got a little bit of greed, but not personal gain, but gain what you think is right for the union now. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and you identify with that. When you when you gain what you think is right for the union, you feel that you've made a contribution and, and you have made an achievement here. I think we've all gained, yeah. yeah. I'm terribly interested in the part. I'm... Uh, I'm hoping that uh, 
somebody won't get in this park and completely forget about it now. If we can get the people interested in that park, it'll, we'll just have such great participation. Uh, winter and summer, I think. Uh -huh. And uh, per, or, uh, per capita wise, the park is really not going to cost much money. See, if you figure, if you figure the man, the the family uh, members, I don't know what the family is considered average now, but say three and a half or say four people. You say there's only three thousand members, which is more than that now. That's twelve thousand people. See, and when they can go out there and participate in swimming and horseshoe and basketball and skating and fishing and uh, uh, we're going to have a lot of other little games that you can play on the ground. Like picnicking. Oh, all kinds of dancing. Picnicking and kid equipment, dancing. And uh, this barn, when we get it done, uh, unless it gets out of hand, we could let people have that for family uh, parties, maybe. Parties, as long as it's strictly family and no booze. Uh -huh. And uh, reunions and stuff like that, where it's a little hard to have it. City parks anymore right. without getting abused by maybe roughies or toughies or something like that, you know. Uh -huh. We won't have to worry about that out there. So I think if uh, people will take advantage of it, that thing will be wonderful. And I'm just afraid that in the future, if you happen to get a president or executive board that's a little lax and participate in that thing and letting it go by the wayside, well, it'll uh, go to spoil. Uh, well, it seems to me that you're making tremendous uh, headway out there so far. Uh, you've made uh, a great deal of improvement since well, you bought it three years ago. It's going to be real nice. Yeah. How many buildings do you have uh, on the playgrounds now, or on, in the park? As a well, we have this two-story barn with a great big white grand on it and a real nice restroom, which we're building on to it now. Of course, the barn will be two floors. It'll be paneled. It'll be real nice. It's going to be air conditioned and heated. The barn will be air conditioned. Yeah, we're figuring on it. Mm -hmm. And uh, because we figure when we have peak clothes in the barn, maybe a hundred people or something like that, well, it could be uncomfortable. So we felt like we ought to have air conditioning. At least we're getting figures on it. We have a nice new bathhouse and concession area. Of course, we have our old bathhouse, which we probably won't use now, but for storage and maybe. Restroom facilities and peak loads, like when we have our picnic or something like that. I think last year's picnic they had better than 4,000 people out there. Mm -hmm. Or five, I think you said. Then uh, we're figuring on building, building a nice looking pole barn in the near future to, to house. Uh, we got a truck and a tractor with a mower and several hand mowers, and we got we can house our picnic benches and storage like that for the winter. We've got a real nice home for the care keeper out there now. The guy keeps care of the ground. We've built a three-car garage behind it, and uh, maybe for a tractor, and maybe for his car, and uh, a pickup, or whatnot. But that's the extent of the buildings on it until we build our uh, shelter house out in the woods. Where uh, I don't think I mentioned before, you know, we've got an area now we're laying off for a ball diamond out there. No, I don't think you did mention that. It'll be another. It'll be another activity we'll have, and we got uh, ground for a, a lot of more things, like a golf driving range or whatever. Yeah, well, you mentioned that too, and I think that would be a, an excellent uh, attraction for uh, the workers at Warner Gear to be able to go out and have their own uh, driving range. Uh, well, I'm certainly very favorably impressed with uh, the change that I have seen uh, when I worked at Warner Gear. Uh, uh, I was active for a couple of three years in the uh, labor movement, and I know we had to, to meet in the Benetton building down on South Walnut Street. And uh, since that time, you've uh, built this uh, magnificent structure, uh, which houses not only Local 287 uh, in the meeting uh, uh, room, but also uh, several other locals uh, in the area have office facilities here. You have a, a beautiful parking area out back with the uh, shade. And uh, now you have this uh, very fine uh, park about uh, four or five miles away from uh, the labor center uh, with uh, all the fine facilities such as uh, opportunities for fishing, horseshoe pitching, uh, swimming, uh, 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 baseball, and uh, possibly a driving range and uh, several other things that you're mentioning. So uh, it seems to me that uh, the labor movement then uh, has uh, come a long way, and in addition to that, uh, uh, 20 or 25 years ago, uh, the ordinary fellow who uh, operated a machine uh, did not live in uh, 
twenty, thirty thousand dollar middle class home out in the suburbs. And so I think you have the very concrete, tangible achievements. In addition to the ones you have mentioned, such as uh, improved working conditions, cleaner air, shorter hours, uh, more harmonious relations with a boss, and several other things. So it uh, seems to me that you've covered a great deal of uh, terrain here during the course of our discussion, and I've enjoyed it immensely, and I am uh, quite sure that uh, any student of history or Muncie uh, in the future who might want to listen to your tape, uh, Mr. Earl, will uh, gain uh, a great deal of insight into the community and into uh, the thinking of the man who mans the machine or works in the factory and what the labor union has meant to him and uh, from his uh, perspective uh, what the Muncie community is like. And uh, again, thank you very much. It's been uh, most generous of you to take the time. Do you have a comment? I'd just like to say one more thing about Park. I think it'll be on this date. All right. Because it might be historical one of these days in the community of Muncie. I forgot to mention that on top of a flagpole in front of a barn, there's a brass spire that weighs about, I forget, I think it weighed about 18 pounds. And we drill a hole in that brass spire that sits on top of the flagpole and put a brass plaque in there stating the cost of the park, uh, the name of the members on the board, and also when the park was bought, and then the name of the members that was on the board when the park was dedicated, who the organization was that dedicated it, and uh, that is sealed up in that spar, and maybe it'll never be found. Maybe the flagpole will blow down someday and be discarded as junk. But uh, there is this thing in this little brass bar above the flagpole that if it, whenever it comes down, somebody could unscrew a little brass screw and find that bronze plate in there with this information on it. Well, that's quite interesting, and it might very well happen that way. hundred years from now, maybe. Right. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ken. Okay. I really enjoyed talking with you. Same to you, Dan.